Greetings, welcome back to Astrologaster. Let's continue. Okay, who are you? Even, sir. Who do I have the pleasure of welcoming to my chambers this day? Nicholas Muggs, uh, proprietor of Muggs Rugs down on Silver Street. Ah, the wig makers. Uh, you supply wigs to players, do you not? I have heard tell of your fine work from some of my playhouse querents. I thank you for your kindness, sir. I do hear you are very skilled at your trade also. For are you not the curer of the plague of 92? Forsooth, I do hope you may cure me as well. For though I do not think I have the plague, whatever I have is doubtless most grave. No matter what my wife thinks. And what is it your wife thinks? It be her mind that I have taken naught but a chilly cold in the head. But tis not so, Dr. Foreman, for I ache all over. My throat is grown sore and I cough day and night. Day and night, you say? I verily. <laughs> it's cold. Then let us consult the stars. What does ail Nicholas Mug? Well, he wouldn't like to hear that his wife's wife can be right. Mac is travel, troubled with hypochondria, possibly induced by witchcraft. This condition could be one day prove fatal. Mag has taken a cold in the head, the symptoms of which include a cough, short white windedness, a hoarse throat, and pain throughout the body. Mag is suffering from a cardiac passion, characterized by short windedness and grievous pain, both in the heart and throughout the body. body. Yeah. It's cold, head. I'm pleased to say that your wife is correct, and you have little to worry over. You have what we doctors call frigidus ad hominem, or as it is more commonly known, a man cold. Fi frigid. A man cold, you say? Aye, it is a cold in the head, suffered uniquely by those of the male sex. And although it be a minor affliction, the suffering can be very great. A minor affliction, you say? That cannot be right. I bid you check the stars again, sir. For see how ill I am. And my throat grows so hoarse I can hardly... Okay, you're hypochondriac mm. as well. I think the trouble in your throat may be occasioned by overuse. Perhaps you might try uh, discoursing less. Well, I, I think you ought to know that I will be seeking a second opinion. As you will, sir. Good day. Yeah, he's hypochondriac. Oh. Hello. I wonder how anyone was cured back then. Hey, my lord, how may I do you service? Would it pertain to some thrilling adventure upon which you may soon be embarking? Indeed it does. Sir Walter Raleigh and I did recently come across some intelligence concerning a fleet of Spanish ships that will soon be sailing home from the New World, bearing a goodly cargo of gold. Ooh. Raleigh and I plan to borrow the royal fleet, which we will use to intercept the ships and seize the treasure. Huzzah! But, uh, borrow the Royal Navy, you say? Aye. Only temporarily, of course. The Queen will hardly know her ships are gone. You Indeed, must steal her ships! To her bearing a handsome prize of Spanish gold, she will doubtless forgive our failure to file the correct paperwork and whatnot. Ah, uh, doubtless. And how may I assist your Lordship in this glorious endeavor? Well, in order to intercept the Spanish fleet, we must know which route it is planning to take. One possibility is that it returns to Spain, having retrieved the gold from the New World's southern continent. The other possibility, and this is the one Sir Walter thinks most likely, is that the gold has already been transported by conquistadors from the southern continent up to Havana, and the ships are to fetch it from there. Ah, then let us see oh, whether no. the can tell us upon which route the treasure ships may be intercepted uh. on their return to Spain from the New World. Will they be sailing from the southern continent? Or from the Spanish colony of Havana. How the hell am I supposed to know that? Is there anything that would show me? The crew of the Spanish ships happened upon the gold by conquering and killing its owners. 
what the hell, through the conquering of foreign peoples, the king of Spain is establishing a fine cultural legacy for future generations. That makes... what? What's, <laughs> does that make any sense for the case? The Spanish sailors hide a shameful secret that releases the lack of self-control. The Veru should not trust his friend Lele's instincts. Women factor into Spaniards travel plans. Okay, I'll tell you about this. The stars are of the same mind as your friend, Sir Walter Raleigh. Now, for regardless of where the Spaniards load their ships with gold, they will stop at the port of Havana. It seems the Spanish sailors will be unable to uh, calm their carnal desires. Excellent, excellent. But where are we to intercept them? Pray, give me the precise day, latitude, and longitude. Uh, certainly, my lord. Uh, no. Divining nautical coordinates is a somewhat lengthy and complex process. If your lordship would kindly return in an hour or so... Quickly, or... sir! I have not the time to bide here all day. Ah, uh, well, well then, uh, let me see now. Uh, taking into account the position of Jupiter, uh, divide by three, carry the one. Ah, uh, yes. The Spanish treasure ships may be intercepted upon the 15th day of October at a latitude of 9 and 40 degrees north and 5 and 20 degrees west, or thereabouts. That said, however, I cannot promise you that... Excellent. Raleigh and I shall sail to this very spot. I'm gonna Huzzah. die. Huzzah! Godspeed, my lord. He's gonna kill me. I was a little pleased. Oh, we, we, don't, we only need 20 more. Oh, hello. Black? Did, was that your father? How might I? I pray go tell your master, Mr. Foreman, that Mistress Alice Blag is come to see him. Ah, Mistress Blag. It is I, Dr. Simon Foreman, at your service. And what an honor it is to welcome the wife of the Dean of Rochester to my humble practice. To whom do I owe my thanks for having recommended you to my care? Well, I will not lie. You owe your thanks to nobody. For folk do tell me that you are not a real doctor, but a quack, who does conjure demons and dabbles most unlawfully in the dark arts. Uh, I do assure you, madam, that whatever you may have heard, I am yeah, a... Nay, yeah, do not quibble, sir. If I did seek the counsel of a doctor who has one of those fancy medical degrees, of the kind of high-bred know-it-all who does see fit to judge a woman and vex her most cruelly, I would have gone elsewhere. But, truth be told, I have need of such a man as you, for I have been bewitched. She's no fool, you said. Ah, I see. Yea, a loathsome spell has been cast upon me. It does cause me to awaken in the morning with a most terrible pain in my head. A pain so wretched it does have me chundering into my chamber pot. Pain You're pregnant. In and involuntary purging. And what leads you to believe your suffering is occasioned by witchcraft? Well, the timing is most unnatural. My troubles do occur every Saturday morning without oh. fail. I suspect the doings of our new neighbor, the Widow Macdoon. As well as being Scottish, she does possess several cats. Several cats, you say? Hmm. Uh, one or two of which I may have kicked, and now she has seen fit to take revenge upon me with her dark, foreign magic. You, you said she's kind. It is well known for the powerful black witchcraft practiced by its womenfolk. But as compelling as this evidence may be, my practice does draw upon the latest scientific arts. To diagnose your condition, I must first perform a rigorous astronomical analysis. So, let us see now, what do the stars say is the cause of your Saturday morning suffering? She's hungover. Of course, that she's not pregnant, she's just hungover. Alice's symptoms are caused by noxious food or drink. Means the condition is chronic, dependent blood bile. This suggests severe addiction. Alice, a, Alice is experiencing early symptoms of being with child. The presence of the moon suggests that the symptoms are acute. No, it's not. Alice bewitched. No, it's that. Noxious food or drink. Uh, madam, may I delicately inquire as to whether it be the habit of you and your husband to take wine with supper? On Friday evenings, perchance? 
Uh, drinking a little overmuch on occasion is nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, many of my most respectable querers do find that a fine French claret can be deceptively... Oh, nay, more's the pity. My husband is a tiresome teetotaler who prefers to spend his evenings writing sermons and counting coin. He hardly ever accompanies me to the tavern on Fridays. <laughs> uh, does he not? Well, in any case, uh, I am much afraid that the ale you do consume upon these tavern visits may be to blame for your affliction. Uh, the consumption of strong drink can provoke an excess of black bile, which then does cause the body to purge itself the following day. I do advise you to consider... Then I am not bewitched. No. <gasps> but if that be true, then to poor Molly McDoon, I have been most rude and unneighborly. For shame. I must go to her this hour and apologize. Fare you well, Mr. Foreman. I must bid you good day. You're welcome, I guess. Yay! Oh? Ah, well met, Mr. Mug. How fair you since our first consultation. It seems as you were right. <laughs> Though I was in sooth much troubled with the vile disease of what did you say it was? Friggy, uh, fudgy puss and honey man. I did not die. Frigidus ad hominem. I am most glad to hear it, sir. Indeed, you do look well. Well? Mayhap I look well now, but will not be for long. I have been poisoned. Of course. And by the saints, who is the author of this foul deed? My friend George Sprottle, the bookbinder. I did dine with him not two hours ago. Ah, I see. A bout of evil digestion. Pray tell. Was there turned meat or some such at table? Nay, not meat. Twas a pie full of cherries. I had a bite of it afore I knew what I was eating. Ah, uh, cherries, you say? Aye, cherries. And this after I took particular care to give Mistress Sprottle a list of foods I must not eat. I added cherries to the list when I did hear that the Countess of Devonshire has declared against their noxious qualities. The Countess of Devonshire, you say? Noxious qualities, indeed. And now your symptoms, Mr. Mug. Had you any reaction after eating these cherries? My reaction? Well, I reacted as any man would. I spat them out. I know you what Mr. Sprottle did then, Dr. Foreman. Nay, but pray tell. He did laugh at me. He even called me a dinner ralphing fusspot. Fie. I may soon be in the grave, thanks to George. Will he still be laughing then? Well, let us not speculate, shall we, Mr. Mug? Now, let us see what these stars may tell us. What ails Nicholas Mug? He's a hypo hypochondriac. Mug is suffering from terrible poisoning. Mug is splenetic, occasioned by rancorous behavior. Okay, give me a second here, I need to check something. Okay, I don't think he's splenetic, which means that he's easily annoyed. Right, the, the cherry poisoning. It seems you have indeed been poisoned. The cherries have provoked an imbalance of collar. You must take the antidote for cherry poisoning, which is uh, let me see what I have here in my cabinet. Ah, yes, Saccharum officinarum. Uh, dissolve a pinch of these crystals on your tongue Sugar. for a week. Saccharum? Saccharum officinarum, uh, more commonly known as sugar. <laughs> you it. I have heard tell of sugar. Tis a rare and fine substance, I do believe, and therefore doubtless most efficacious. You gave him placebo. Placebo. Oh, good thinking, though. Day. Nay, you're quite sure about that, are you? 
Oh, I see. <sighs> I cannot understand it. Why has Avis not come these past weeks? Does she no longer wish to see me? No, oh, she'll come back. Come on. Oh. I have been deprived of tender favors of late, but my fortune seems to be reversing. I expect to see Avis again soon. Mistress Alan's re reluctant, reluctance to see me is but the legacy of my unpleasant manner towards her in the past, Provo provoked by my suspicious fancy. Yeah, that may be it. Avis feels that she has treated her husband carelessly. It was cruel of Avis to allow me to hope that we would one day be together. It is only self-constraint and a sense of duty toward her husband that keeps Avis from- No, it's not true. Avis, Avis's feelings cannot be trusted. She harbors romantic things towards another man. Avis does not know who has fathered the child she carries. I think this is the one. So, it is the madness of my love that keeps Avis away. Yep. My jealous passions and accusations of Vector. Yes. Have a fight. When she comes to see me again, for she surely will, by and by, I must remember to be kinder to her, to not plague her with my suspicions. And until Avis does return, well, there are other women in the world, are there not? Are you serious? How the hell am I supposed to give myself a letter of recommendation? I wonder what's that about. Sir, I must uh, thank you for resolving the misunderstanding betwixt me and my neighbor, Mistress Molly Macdoon. You advised me that my Saturday morning headaches and chanderings were not caused by her witchcraft, but by my consumption of strong drink. You spoke true, and for that I am grateful. Although if Molly was not then the altar of my suffering, she surely is now. For since we are become friends, we go together to the Friday to the tavern every Friday. You quarant Alice Black. Thank you. You guys don't like her very much, do you? Good day, Mistress Lania. Much time has passed since I last saw you. How do you fare? In truth, not well, Dr. Foreman. Not well at all. Then I am full sorry for it, madam. Pray, tell me, what manner of ill has befallen you? First, I must beseech your pardon, sir. For methinks Mr. Lania <laughs> be my prowler after all, as you did surmise. I think nothing of it, madam. But what has made you change your mind about him? I have been publicly humiliated. Mr. S has been circulating a collection of insulting sonnets about an unnamed dark lady, and all of London thinks this dark lady is me. Well, your complexion is rather... Uh, is I say... am described as having foul breath and black wires for hair. Though me thinks the very worst line is the one that tells of a gross body rising at the utterance of my name. And I cannot abide illusions, Dr. Foreman. If Mr. S wishes to reference bodily levitation and other such cheap stage magic, he would do well to leave my name out of it. My interest is in the dramatic arts, not fairground attractions. I am not sure that is quite his meaning. Dr. Foreman, you know of Mr. William Shakespeare, then. Do not tell me you have read the sonnets. Well, I... I own that I have. But, as you did remark, madam, all of London has read them. Oh, well, I am undone. My professional reputation is now utterly spoiled, for now the whole world will look upon me as naught but Mr. Shakespeare's fancy wench. No longer will they judge me on my own merits. Let us hope it is not as grave as that, madam. Have you discoursed upon the matter with him? Nay, I dare not confront him about it. For we are almost at an end with our work on a play, and I dare not risk it not being staged. Hmm. Then let us see what the stars advise. What may Mistress Lanier do to restore her professional reputation? Okay, let's see. Mistress Lanier harbors secret through thoughts of adultery, which relate somehow to her intellect and her feelings of dissatisfaction. Mistress Lanier is ignorant of her romantic feelings and this must be reversed. 
Mistress Lanier should abandon her career ambitions and revert to her true vocation, bringing forth new life. She should have another child. God will help Mistress Lanier if she exercise, exercises constraint and discipline. Mistress Lani, Lanier is confused about her feelings for me? How interesting. What the? The relationship between Mr. Shakespeare and Mistress Lanier is not an equal one. Shakespeare's arrogance will overshadow Amelia's contribution to the play they are writing. Miss Treslania must find a way to dissociate her name from these sonnets, for if she does not her for if she does not, her literary legacy will be betrayed by association with them. Yep. I right to be concerned about the damage to your reputation, Mistress Lanier, for there is a danger that your partnership with Mr. Shakespeare and his depiction of you in his sonnets will forever overshadow your own literary achievements. God's womb. But what can I do to forestall such an injustice? I suggest you spread a rumour of your own about another lady. For instance, there is a brothel owner in Clerkenwell they call Black Luce. If you were to put it about that she is the subject of Shakespeare's sonnets, twould do her reputation no harm. Indeed, the effect would be quite the reverse, for doubtless there be many a man at present who would pay handsomely for a tumble with Shakespeare's dark lady. I do feel it is most important to advance the interests of my fellow women, especially those seeking to make their way in business. No! Oh, do you see that, Dr. Foreman? It is your mute Italian querent, Signor Ferraro. He is staring at us through the window. Is he? Ah, then doubtless he has come for another consultation. You're welcome. Yes, another letter of recommendation. Indeed, it is him. Hey, senor, and well met. Tis I, Riccardo Ferraro, come once again to see the great doctor Simon Foreman. Indeed, I did recognize you, senor. How may I assist you this day? I am ill. I tell you my problems. First problem, I do make a chandar in the morning. Next problems. My belly does swell, and my chest is a most tender to the touch. And now, for the very most You're pregnant. problems, I have a big fuse. One moment I do whip, and the next I do curse and gnash my teeth. Okay, it's menopause. So, dottore, yeah. you tell what ails me, huh? You wanna make a... You wanna make a water into this cup? Un momento. Uh, nay, not in my the hell? Prithee, hold. Uh, if you please, Signor. As with our previous consultations, I shall be judging your illness by reading the stars. So uh, you need not a mind? No. Hey, senor, I have no need of I it. think his mustache is falling down. Physicians do spy and sniff their patients' urine. I find this method of piss pot diagnosis most imprecise. Indeed, the practice is quite primitive. It is my belief that if medicine is to advance in this modern age, we must all adopt a more scientific method. I am quite sure history will bear me out on this question. Eh, this is scientific method. <laughs> this is reading my diagnosis in the stars? Precisely so. <laughs> Speaking thereof, perchance we may consult the stars now. What illness troubles Signor Ricardo Ferraro? He is... he's a phony. He's not a patient. He tries to frame me into something. Signor Ferraro is troubled with apoplexy, a condition of the brain provoked by a sudden fit. It affects sensory perception and causes swollen neck veins, memory loss and gnashing of the teeth. Signor Ferraro suffers from muttering in the breast, which is a guttering of corrupt matter in the chest area, occasionally occasioning pain in the breast. Senor Ferraro is with child, yeah, that's, that's it. Okay, so it's either that. This is just a mighty mouse of color. 
No matter, just like an paint. Yeah, that would be the best. Melt enchantment cast by which okay, I'm not going with the cut with the chat. You are merely troubled by mattering in the breast. I advise you to take to bed and cover yourself with sheets that have been warmed before a fire. But you must not sleep, nor may you eat or drink, for food and drink would serve to increase the corrupt phlegm and matter in your chest. Mattering in the breast. Hmm. Most dottori would say my problems do not match the signs of mattering in the breast. But you, Signor Foreman, are not most dottori, eh? I did that of you, child. Genius of the medicine who does find true meaning in the stars. I thank you, Signor Foreman, for your advice has been most enlightening. Ricardo Ferraro bids you. I don't day. trust him one bit. It's too, way too suspicious. What? Huh? But there was. But there were pluses from his head. I don't understand it, okay. At least he's he is easy <laughs> to read. Cherries resolve itself in the end. Those sugar crystals you gave me did work wondrous well. <laughs> Dr. Foreman, me thinks you should fashion this medicine into little round pills and sell them by the score. I warrant you would make your fortune. Ah, <laughs> yes. If only I could have my querents believe that mere sugar pills were the cure for all their ills, great and small. I would be a very rich man indeed, would I not? And what may I assist you with this day, Mr. Mug? I have the spotted fever. I must begin treatment now, or else Hold, I'll... Hold, sir. The spotted fever is exceeding rare. Why would you think you have such a disease? Well, sir, not only am I covered all over in red spots, I have lately taken to chundering, such as are the very symptoms listed in the medical book I did read. I am already taking the treatment Mr. Cogan prescribes, but now I require... You mean to say you have read Thomas Cogan's Haven of Health? Why, that is a most technical book, rich for doctors and medical students. How did you come to be reading it? My friend George Sprottle did bind a printing of it in his shop. He kindly let me spy some pages of what was sent up to Cambridge. Oh, but Dr. Foreman, I forget myself. You have no medical degree, so you doubtless have not read it. Mayhap if I ask George nicely... Sir, I... Um, uh, let us consult the stars and... See if they may tell us what ails you. You're wrong in, your, in the head. Mark suffers from hypochondria induced by the appearance of many pimples on the privy member. Mark is troubled with evil digestion. Mark has the spotted fever. Treat me for the spotted fever. Well, I guess he would be kind. He would like to hear that he has a spotted fever, but I really think he has hypochondria. But you know what? We will treat him. You do indeed suffer from the spotted fever, Mr. Mug. Now, as to your cure. Aye. It does require some uncommon ingredients that I do not keep here in my chambers at present. A moment, pray, while I write this down. Here. Take this recipe to your apothecary and have him make you up a preparation. Take a spoonful each morning until your red spots disappear. Oh, ground up horns of a deer and cinnamon. How very fine. And this red coral from the South Seas. Aye, verily. Nothing but the finest of cures for my loyal querents. It is just as well for us that I did consult Mr. Cogan's book, is it not, Dr. Foreman? Yeah, yeah. In my word, my wife was very wrong to doubt him. I shall tell her you said so. One thing more, if you please, Dr. Foreman, for I feel I must give ye warning. A great storm is coming. I feel it in my bones, and my bones do always speak true. You would do well to bide indoors at the first sign of wind and rain. God keep ye well, Dr. Foreman. Thank you. God damn it, we are almost there. So another letter of recommendation. Okay, but that's gonna be it for today. Thank you very much. Stay alive and see you soon.